broadcasting live from Detroit, Michigan, and all around the world. The Church Militant is Mike. Here's your host, Michael Morris. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to this week's Mike Up. Mike Up there, Michael Morris, your host here from ChurchMilton.tv. A very interesting show for you with a couple of things, but one thing I'd like to get into just before we begin uh, in the body of the show is. Have you noticed from a Catholic point of view how much the Republican Party leadership is actually selling out on issues that Catholics predominantly care about, faithful Catholics? There, is, there has been this split within the Republican Party for a while, you know, the, the social conservatives, the people concerned about family values and that sort of thing point to the more uh, the Republicans who are more liberal and uh, radical on those things like abortion, same-sex marriage, contraceptives, and all that sort of thing, uh, and point to them and call them rhinos, Republican in name only. Well, this is becoming an increasing, increasingly dangerous position uh, of what's going on within the Republican Party because, because more and more uh, uh, Republican and so-called conservative groups who like to hang their shingle out and say, hi, we're conservative, are conservative really only on sort of economic policies, on everything else across the board. They are really kind of morphing into Democrats. Now, we we, uh, talked to Molly Smith last week about the the problem with uh, Senator, U.S. Senator, Republican Senator uh, Robert Portman, who all of a sudden came out in favor of same-sex marriage because he says, you know, my son's gay. And be, what they didn't tell you is that he already knew that long before. So he switched positions intentionally. So you could no longer really call him a conservative on social issues. Then we have, of course, you know, this week, uh, you know, Governor Chris Christie, you know, all the conservatives four years ago, two years ago, oh, please run, please run for president. Oh, you know, he's such a conservative. You know, the guy has some very bizarre, and he's a Catholic. And he has very bizarre positions uh, with regard to the issue of same-sex marriage. And and most predominantly, what he just did was sort of uh, give the big thumbs down in the state of New Jersey to uh, helping younger men and women who have same-sex attraction actually sort of begin to deal with this and psychological counseling and all that kind of thing. He just oh thumbs down it because, of course, that's the popular position. He would have said, so you got to look at some of these guys and say on these social positions, if you were to stand up Obama and stand up any one of them next to them, what would be the difference? It's not really a degree of kind. It's really a degree of just difference. So these are very troubling, uh, troubling things. And as we get ready and head into, uh, you know, after Thanksgiving, this coming Thanksgiving, we'll start warming up for the 2014 campaign. And you're going to see all these people painting themselves as social conservatives and conservatives. And they're really not. So I think at this sort of downtime, the sort of green time of the political season, I think faithful Catholics have to ask themselves, are they going to keep going along trying to get these incremental victories where you get a little this, and a little that, but all you're doing is just sort of slowing the edge, uh, slowing from falling off the edge. It's a, it's a big concern. I think Catholics really need to start having that discussion. Are we really going to keep putting our political support behind people who, at the end of the day, are enemies of the church? They just may not be as big enemies, or at least not publicized that way. But, you know, you line up... Uh, uh, you know, line up some of these Republicans, some of these Republican Party leaderships against Obama, and on these issues, I don't know that you can tell the difference. So that's our little two cents worth for that. Now, turning to uh, one of our main topics tonight: Freemasonry. Freemasonry. What is Freemasonry? What's its involvement in the Catholic Church? To help answer those questions, we have our very own Michael Miller. How you doing, Michael? We'll knock, try to knock over the microphones here between us. So, oh, yeah. uh, Michael has been working on um, has been working on a uh, along with the whole research team been working on a uh, uh, FBI a, a faith based investigation uh, program on Freemasonry for quite a while now. And just to give you an idea of what goes into one of these, this is the script for it. That's an awful lot of work, Mike. That's an awful lot of research. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into that. This is this is amazing. I'm going to pass it over to you, and I'm going to say, what is first of all, what is Freemasonry? You know, you hear this all the time, particularly from people you know in the Catholic community. Always go, oh, it's those Freemasons. Oh, it's Freemasons. Oh, it's a it's 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 a conspiracy. It's Freemason. Freemason. Are all of their uh, um, conspiracy theories to be dismissed because they're conspiracy theories? Well. Um, let's start with what they are. Um, you know, it's a fraternal organization Mm -hmm. that's devoted to, uh, building the, uh, and it's really hard to get into this. 
one interesting fact that we found in studying is that Freemasonry is, is according to them, the most written on topic there is. And if you can think about that. So, um, that's if pretty I, amazing. <laughs> if I stumble over uh, where to go with this, uh, when you ask a question, that, that is because my brain is struggling to find which storehouse of information I want to <laughs> go and grab something from. But um, what they are is uh, a fraternal organization that tries to um, do good works and uh, essentially um, lead their members uh, to heaven uh, in their own particular way. Uh, and that's a layman's way of explaining it. Well, it doesn't sound so bad. Do good works and get to heaven. It's kind of Catholic. Yeah. But? <laughs> but. There's always that but, right? Um, yeah, and this is a big old but. <laughs> <laughs> they have their own way of doing it. All right. Um, and and that is, um, that's the problem, is they, they believe in uh, works-based salvation. They believe that you can earn your own salvation. They do not say that Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. He is not the Savior. Mm-hmm. All religions are equal paths to heaven. Okay. So you see those coexist bumper stickers? Yeah. That's kind of, I feel— It's kind of a philosophical statement of the Freemasonry? Right. Without them actually saying it's theirs, I feel like that sums it up quite nicely. Do you think that there is a, a, a sort of a, a misperception or misconception on the part of many Catholics who think, yeah, it's no big deal about being a Freemason, be a Freemason, you know, it's, it's kind of like a Knights of Columbus, you know, you hang out in the beer hall, you have a couple of drinks, hang out with your buddies, play some poker, put on a funny little hat, do secret handshake and go home. It, that's pretty much the perception, I think, on most people's part, isn't it? And, you know, they go around and do good things and help, you know, you know, children who are handicapped and that sort of thing, fundraise, but... You know, as far as just kind of when we get together, it's kind of like, you know, Fred and Barney, hand, you know, hang, you know, heading down to the, the hall and the grand poobah puts on his hat and there you go, right? That's how most people see it. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but that's not the reality at all, is it? That's not what our script says. That's not the reality. Um, of course, you have to keep in mind many of the, the initial levels are just that, social uh, let's have a beer. Let's go do some good works, and let's let's get ahead in my my job, my career. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's when you get to the higher ranks of masonry when you start to discover things are a little different than what I originally understood. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where uh, we try to uh, expose some of those things, what their real true goals are. And this sounds very conspiratorial. It sounds very you know, but it it's all in their material. It's nothing that we're making up out of thin air. It's it really comes from their own mouths. I mean, I think one thing that Catholics might be concerned about, uh, or at least alarmed about initially, is when you look at this, you would say, um, you know, this is the number one condemned uh, activity uh, uh, by the popes in history. That's right. The number one thing that that more popes have written about this than any other topic. That's amazing. That says a lot. That's amazing. Yep. And every one of them has been just outright condemnatory of it. Oh, yeah. Catholics cannot be Catholic and Freemason can't happen. That's right. That's Becoming right. a Freemason at one point was even you were automatically excommunicated just by virtue of the fact you became one. Yeah. I guess there's still some question, of, you know, whether that's exactly the case now or not. But none, nonetheless, it's a horrible thing if you're a Catholic. Why? What, Freemasonry has a philosophy that's really kind of directly opposed to Catholicism on almost every level, right? That's right. You touched on a couple of them, but let's go into that a little bit. Well, um, when you are uh, entered into, the first phase is called entered apprenticeship. Um, And so when you join the the Freemasons, you go through uh, initiation of sorts. And in that initiation, you take a blood oath. And that blood oath basically says, I will not reveal the secrets of Freemasonry and I swear this upon my own blood. And they go forward to list uh, uh, just a litany of uh, terrible things that will, they'll allow themselves to, to undergo, you know, taking your bowels and having them pulled out, and yeah, we won't go there. Um, but, you know, that's um, essentially when, when they take that oath, that replaces uh, their Catholic faith. Yeah. That's, that's a blood oath in front of God, and it's... it's um, how do I want to say this? It's it's an oath of of frivolity. Um, you're you're basically saying I will allow myself to be cut if I give away our secret password. Yeah. So so it's kind of an opting out, really. I mean, if you're you know, so here you are, you're a Catholic, and if you're going to go on that side, 
you have to say no to this side, to your faith, in order to get into this side. Correct. Kind of like you can't be in two places at the same time. Right, right. It, okay. A lot of Catholics don't know that's what they're doing when they take this oath. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't think through the words they're saying, um, but they say it, I think, three times, um, you know, that upon my own pain, my own blood, mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm going to do this. So uh, it's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, they do this to themselves. We hear an awful lot of things, uh, you know, about Freemasonry, uh, you know, sort of sneaking into the church, Freemasons in in various positions of influence in many cases in the church, uh, that they have infiltrated uh, various governments. And infiltrated might not be, it's like a secret camp of Freemasons. I mean, some people are just sort of known that they're, you know, part of Masonic lodges. I think at one part in the show, if I remember, we actually just go down a list of what dozens and dozens of big name people who are Freemasons that you wouldn't know unless you went and looked for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it, is this really just the case that here's one philosophy just incompatible with Catholicism? And they're just at war with each other, and people who are Freemason or have a Freemason indoctrination get into here and try to upset the apple cart. Is it really that sort of, it's a big 30,000-foot overview, but is it really that kind of simple? Um, so you're saying the Freemasons actually infiltrate the church and our— And governments, and sure. Um, you know, yes and no. I, I guess it's a little more complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, they certainly do um, fill the seats of various government positions— um, and there are certainly Freemasons within the church. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we know just in the news uh, a few months back, yeah. a French uh, priest was, was kicked out of his, um, I don't know if, it, if his faculties were removed or what the case was, but yeah, his archbishop did. Right. Found out he was a Freemason and said, whoa, what's going on here? You can't be a Freemason and a, and a priest or Catholic. Right. But he had been for a long time. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I think there was some some confusion, even even amongst the bishops for a while, as to is this allowed now? Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, folks didn't know if if things had changed somehow, uh, where the church thought that it's okay to to be a Freemason, but mm-hmm. um, that that never changed, never will change, uh, unless of course the Masons somehow do a, <laughs> you know, I, I can't even speculate on and what that would that situation would would entail, but. Um, Masons are everywhere. Um, America has the largest population of Masons in the world, uh, three to four million, I believe. Which is uh, funny that this, because this can, this began in Europe. That's right. Sort of a European thing. Got transplanted over here when the when when what when, when seventeen seventeen was the year that the the sort of the big lodge began in England. That's right. I mean, certainly the colonists were over here at this point, but it makes this jump across the Atlantic and then finds its richest soil here, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's kind of a, an oddity because it really is sort of a European thing. Isn't it? Yeah. It, it, um, and it took on a life of its own over here. Like I said, it's, it is predominantly a beer drinking club and a do-gooder club over here. Um, but yeah, the, the, some of our founding fathers were Masons, Ben mm-hmm. Franklin, uh, George Washington, although that's, commonly misunderstood he wasn't um deeply involved with it and we believe that he did uh repent on his deathbed and and became catholic Mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing yes wonderful thing yeah um but yeah the the what we understand to be the more um i don't want to say maybe the more malignant side of masonry is european yeah um you know the the there are two rights the york right and the scottish right Mm -hmm. uh you'll you'll learn much more about this once the program is released but, uh, so you got to be sure and watch. That's a plug, folks. That's yeah. a, when he says you'll learn more about it, that means watch it because it's it's actually it's fascinating. I was obviously the host of it, and to, uh, I didn't really know much about Freemasonry before this report. I knew a little bit, you know, the things you hear and pick yeah. up and bits and pieces here and there. But this is really a very. I mean, you guys did a bang up job with this. It's a very systematized. Let's take a look at it. There's no crazy conspiracy things in there. And like you said earlier, I think when your first or second comment that. All of this material is taken from them, their own writings, their own works, and not their like weird freako radicals that you know all the other Masons would you know say, oh no no that you know he doesn't speak for us. Mm-hmm. These are their mainstream guys and their mainstream books and their mainstream writings. That's right. So, That's right. Every lodge recommends you read certain writers, and we grabbed right from the pages of those, of those writers and mm-hmm. just used it in our show. So we didn't quote out of context. We went straight to. We just did put out what they put out themselves. That's right. 
what do you think is probably the as a Catholic, what do you think is sort of the the the, the biggest threat to the faith? Yeah, these these uh, they're, they're it's like pick one, you know, like and amongst the threats, um, and I'll refer to something that Pope Benedict said maybe a few years before he abdicated. Um, he shared with one of his cardinals, Cardinal, cardinal Kenny Zaris, I believe was his name, uh, three of his greatest fears for the church. And one of those fears was the growing influence of European Freemasonry um, in, in the power central areas of, of Masonry in Europe. So, uh, I mean, that speaks a lot. <laughs> That's a pope saying one of my biggest concerns for the church and there's a ton of concerns we have right now. Sure. And he he said that was one of his top three. Yeah, and and who was it that actually appealed to? Uh, I I can't remember if it was Pope Benedict at the time or if it was if he was still Cardinal Ratzinger. But they made an appeal and said they asked the question. You know, hey, are we still like not down with the Freemasons? And he answered back, it's just as dangerous as ever to have nothing to do with it. You know, incompatible. You know, you cannot be a Catholic and a Freemason. And this was very recent. I think it was it was either. Just within a year or two, of, I think, before when he became pope, mm-hmm. or just after. So we're talking probably within just the last ten years. Right, right. Uh, this was, uh, a, a, you know, I think a lot of Catholics just don't understand what this is all about. They don't. They don't. And it's it's really something that they should read up on. Um, like you said, the popes condemned it. That many popes for a reason, mm-hmm. uh, and still do, and still do. It, mm-hmm. Nothing's changed. Um, Certainly, you shouldn't approach the sacraments if you're if you're a Mason right now, and and you have to formally cut your ties with it if you mm-hmm. want to return to the church and to the sacraments. You have to actually sign a document and and uh, you know just put that behind you. Michael Miller calling in for our Freemasonry FBI project. We're going to have this ready. We're just uh, in the process of. Uh, uh, Post production on it right now. Have it wrapped up in probably a couple, three weeks or something. Yep. We'll have you back on and talk about it as it's ready to go. And uh, but we just want to give everybody a little heads up on this. It's it's coming. It's down the road. We know it's kind of the end of the summer, and you know people are starting to get a little lack of days. Go well, not around here. We're not. We no, work sir. 24 hours a day, 36 days a week, 364 <laughs> months a year. That's right. That's what we do here. <laughs> no sleep. No sleep. <laughs> Michael Miller, thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to be talking about. The uh, uproar in the scouting movement about gays, is can, can this really be a Catholic position that you can have a Boy Scout council that has gay scouts in it and this, well, really? Something seems amiss there. We're going to talk about that right after this break. My people suffer for lack of knowledge. Our Lord tells us this to remind us how important education is to our salvation. A premium account at churchmilitant.tv costs you only $10 a month. That premium account will get you access to hundreds of hours of catechesis and church history. As the rock of the church, St. Peter reminds us, we must always be ready to give a reason for our hope. You'll definitely be able to do that as a churchmilitant.tv premium subscriber. Sign up today. Joining us now uh, on this entire uh, issue and how it affected actually uh, girls we're going to talk to first is Patty Garabick. Hello, Patty. How are you? I'm great, Michael. Patty is the founder and executive director of the American Heritage Girls. Now, we don't very often give people an opportunity, Patty, to just tout their own horn and say, hey, we're going to give you a plug here. So we're going to do that with you. Tell us what the American Heritage Girls is, what the, what the organization is. You founded it, and tell us why you founded it. American Heritage Girls is a Christ-centered character development program for girls ages 5 to 18, and it was started in 1995, really as a result of the Girl Scouts change in their promise to God in their Girl Scout promise. No longer in 1993 does a girl have to make an oath to God, and this allowed atheists now to be part of of the Girl Scouts USA, as well as um, all other kinds of um, families and girls. And so really the dream of Julia Gordon Lowe had, had diminished, mission creep had set in, and um, as a dedicated volunteer to that movement for 13 years, but a follower of Christ, um, myself and others thought it was important to start something new for girls that would glorify God, but yet use scout type techniques to make it fun and to make it engaging. Do you think, first of all, you're to be commended to that, commended for that. Congratulations. This is very good. There, there is a, there is a really kind of a sense, isn't there, that 
what the culture, what America used to be on all these different levels. Uh, mission creep, I suppose, is a good way to describe it, to, to uh, borrow your phrase there. Uh, and that the, the restoration, if you want to call it that, or at least, you know, whether it restores America to what it was once or, you know, who knows. But somebody's got to do something, right? And you looked at this and said, well, somebody's got to do something, so by gosh darn it, I'm going to do it. And it wasn't quite that simple, but yeah, it was something like that, Michael. <laughs> and really a calling. We, we felt it was a calling. And um, God seems to have blessed this work. Um, it's, we're in our 18th year, 30,000 girls strong. Um, our interdenominational and our largest denomination that's growing are the Catholic parishes. They're seeing the light on this issue. Well, I want to ask you about that for a second to make the sort of the, the segue to uh, to the Catholic issue uh, with Girl Scouts, because there, <clears throat> while this whole Boy Scout and the homosexual thing was going on in the last couple of years, and of course coming to a, a head with the Boy Scouts vote a couple months ago, earlier in the summer, uh, while that was going on, it's kind of going on against the backdrop of this question of the Girl Scouts, uh, because uh, the Girl Scouts have there's all this issues going on about, well, do they support Planned Parenthood? Are they in league with Planned Parenthood? You know, where are they with contraception and all the, you know, the pro-life issues and all that? And there's a big, huge dilemma about that also, isn't there, currently? Oh, absolutely. That's been going on since really the 70s uh, when Betty Friedan served on their board of directors. Um, tell tell our, tell our been... viewers who Betty Friedan is because uh, they, they may not know just uh, uh, what, a, uh, what a horrible philosophy this woman had. Right. She, she is, the, of course, the writer of the feminine mystique and um, often touted as the founder of the feminist movement, um, which really did us feminine women not much good. <laughs> um, however, with that being said, the Girl Scouts continue to have liaisons with groups that are really not uh, aligned with the Catholic Church, in my opinion. And so that's partially, too, why we started American Heritage Girls, so girls could know right from wrong, could have a true moral barometer, so that we could be pro-life, unavowed, you know, with, without any question or, or um, concern that um, girls can uh, be pro-life, learn the importance of life, and be able to talk about that um, within their families and, and make a decision early. I think that's critical that girls have a mindset of the value of life early on. Okay, so we have... We have you and your organization, which I suppose you could describe as something of a breakaway from the Girl Scouts or an alternative now to, you know, uh, you know, sort of reclaiming what the Girl Scouts originally were. You have this. Then you had a relationship for many years. Uh, your organization, uh, American Heritage Girls, had a, a relationship for many, many years of so your entire existence with the Boy Scouts. And then all of a sudden that is no longer the case, Right. What is your, I mean, I've got your press releases here, but let's hear it from you because you're the executive director. What The Boy Scouts be now becoming accepting of homosexuality. What? How does that sit with your group? It's very disconcerting. Our board of directors had made sort of decisions ahead of the vote. Many have criticized us for reacting too quickly, but we knew since February what this proposal would be and how we, we would respond. Um, because we have a very clear statement of faith, statement of values. This wasn't something we were going to talk about for months on end. Um, but we knew that if they had made this decision to allow homosexual boys, and they, they call it homosexual orientation, not same-sex attraction, that this would be a problem for American Heritage Girls and for the promise that we've made to our families and to our communities about what we stood for. And uh, the very reasons why we were started, if we had continued on with the Boy Scouts, would be the very reason why we should not continue on with the Boy Scouts. So, yes, the, the board of directors for the American Heritage Girls unanimously voted to dissolve the memorandum of mutual support, which offered us great resource and great benefit. I'll be honest. Um, but we must stand for what is right and what is godly. It is. Uh, uh, well, it was sad. It was certainly while well, the circumstances of what you had to do. Uh, you know, certainly feel you were forced into, think you were forced into, which I agree. I, I, I don't think there's, I don't know there's any, you know, at some point you got to draw a line in the sand, don't you? That's very true. And particularly when you're dealing with youth development, they need to know what's right and wrong. Do you think that there, what sort of reception for your actions have you guys received? Actually, by and large, plaudits and uh, commendations for the leadership we've taken 
on this issue. Um, there are those are within our group. Of course, there are people without our with you know out the walls of our group who disagree with what we've done, who feel that we're overreacting. Um, but this is the nose in the tent, and you have to remember, 20 years ago we started American Heritage Girls for the very same cycle that this has begun upon, and we're not going to relive that again. All right, uh, Patty Garabig. Patty, stay with us. We're going to go to a little commercial break here real quickly, and we're going to try to bring someone else in from your organization, Julie Goodwin, who is the Catholic Committee Chair for the American Heritage Girls, and she can speak probably also perhaps to some of these things. So this is very troubling for Catholic parents. I mean, we get emails, and we did a Vortex episode, one of my usual uh, daily commentaries or weekday daily commentaries on this, challenging what Ed Martin said here, that scouting is still the best youth-serving program available to all youth. Scouting, he was talking about the Boy Scouts. But, you know, there was a troubling thing here as he said that this is not in conflict with Catholic teaching. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it depends on how you're splitting the hairs there. You don't know. The, no, that's true. There is no official Catholic Church teaching on the Boy Scouts. That's correct. <laughs> and accepting, uh, you know, this is, a, a, but there are certain principles. And again, something isn't wrong or right just because it might violate church teaching in some way. There's a spirit involved here. You know, I wouldn't let my sons go to some sort of event that, uh, you know, tore down what I was trying to teach them about the faith at home. Would it necessarily be a sin for me to let them do that? And, you know, it's not right whether it rises to the level of a sin or it kind of involves itself in that sort of theological area. Uh, you, know, you know, theologians, I suppose, can argue that. But look, you know, I'm a parent responsible for my child's soul. You know, it wants to become an adult. Well, you know, I hope I've done everything I can possibly do. But in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime, while that young boy is here at my house, I'm responsible for getting him to heaven. And the idea that we can say, well, this doesn't really <laughs> violate a church teaching, I, I think the standard needs to be a little lower than does it rise to the level of an actual sin. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll come back and discuss that with you. Uh, and Julie Goodwin also. Uh, I hope she can be standing by. Get her, up, get her up online here. We'll be right back right after this commercial break. Thanks very much, Patty. Thank you. Hey, ChurchMilitant.tv fans. Hopes with Joe Gallagher Season 2 is here in full swing. This season, Joe takes you and your family through 13 of the church's great pontiffs, including some exclusive on-location reporting from the Holy City of Rome. The second season of Popes with Joe Gallagher features Joe's trusty yet extremely quirky sidekick Mumbles, who always has something to say but can't seem to find the right words. This season of Popes is chock full of practical jokes, funny skits, and is sure to become your family's favorite show, from churchmilitant.tv. A churchmilitant.tv premium account for only $10 a month gets you access to all of churchmilitant.tv's premium programs, which includes four new shows every week. And that includes Pope Season 2 with Joe Gallagher. Click the link below and get your family signed up today. Hey, hello, everybody. Back here, Michael Boris with Miked Up Church TV. We were talking about the Boy Scouts uh, and their decision to uh, allow uh, homosexual, open homosexual, uh, gay, uh, you, know, uh, you know, scouts into the troop, and then how that's going to have ramifications and repercussions throughout not just the scouts, but then all sorts of other organizations as well. Organizations that have relationships with them. Uh, one of those is the um, American Heritage Girls, in which we've been uh, talking to the executive director, uh, Patty Garibay. we uh, not sure if we have Julie on the phone. Do we have Julie on the phone? Julie Goodwin? Yes, I'm on. Hello, Julie. How are you? It's nice to hear you. Good. Thank you. You too. Thank you very much for being on. You know, we have Patty here uh, also. Uh, she's up on screen. We don't have your beautiful picture up, but uh, uh, we, do, we do have your beautiful voice. So... <laughs> You work with uh, you work with Patty, obviously, the American Heritage Girls. Can you tell us, and you're in charge of the Catholic Committee, you're the chair for the Catholic Committee, how difficult has this been? What specific problems has this raised for you guys in the, in the realm of the Catholic aspect of this? There, there have been some questions as to why we broke away, um, but, but still, we didn't change anything. We're still who we are. Um, we're a pro-life Christian organization, and it's very fitting for any Catholic parish to form a troop. 
How many of your of your? Uh, I, I believe Patty said you have thirty thousand uh, young girls, young ladies in the in the American Heritage uh, girls. What percentage, roughly, of those are Catholics or Catholic troops? Probably about six thousand. I'm guessing off the top of my head. Um, we have about a. I'm forgetting exactly how many troops we have that are Catholic now, but I think it's around 200, 200 Catholic troops out of 600. Okay, so that's pretty good. So you're talking a quarter to a third, roughly, Patty. Patty's nodding her head here. Yes, so yes. Julie, <laughs> Julie, you've done well on that one. <laughs> uh, listen, if I want to tell you, uh, we, have a, we have a phone call uh, from uh, Yolanda in Oregon, and uh, she may have uh, something to contribute to this, or she might have a question that either one of you might be able to help her answer. Yolanda, are you there? I just wanted to make a comment, you know, I, um, I'm also debating among, you know, having uh, my boys in the Boy Scouts due to the fact that um, I don't think that homosexuality and politics should be part of the BSA. <clears throat> and also, and also because I think that, um, you know, that doesn't belong, you know, to plant the seed with, you know, when we are responsible for the children's souls. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good comment, Yolanda. Thank you, uh, Julie. Let me ask you, and then I'll jump over to you, Patty. Let me ask you: Is there a uh, uh, on the spiritual level here? I mean, look, you guys work with these uh, uh, you know these young girls all the time, as do many, obviously, on the male side in the Scouts. Do you? How do you approach something like this in an organization? Which obviously, which is why you said, "Well, we're you know we're washing our hands with you, and we're done," because we don't think there is a way to approach this. You can't say to a young child, you know, "This is okay," you know, "Don't worry, those mean old church people. This is okay. We're going to affirm you in what is you know a, a life of sin if you per, if you pursue this actively." How do you deal with? I mean, here's a parent, you know, here's Yolanda, you know, do we want to put our boys in this situation? She's right to, I think, I mean, you tell me, I think she's right to have a deep concern about this. She's worried about their souls. Julie? Well, any time a, a girl, if, if a girl were to come forth and say that she was um, considering the fact if she was um, homo homosexual tendencies or same-sex attraction, um, AHG does have, have some documentation on that and some, some guidance that you bring in the pastor, you bring in the family, and you discuss it with them. It, mm -hmm. It's never a cause for immediate dismissal. Right. So you would discuss this with the girl and teach her the biblical values. Would you, uh, 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 Patty, would you kick a girl out who was uh, saying, you know, I, I think I have these lesbian attractions or these, you know, same-sex attractions, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what to do with them. How do you handle that? Absolutely not kick her out, but counsel her, like Julie said, with her, her priest, her family, bringing her alongside, teaching her what right and wrong is. And kids are so confused today. She may even understand that these kinds of feelings during adolescence are not that unusual, but they certainly aren't correct. Mm -hmm. And so to just mm -hmm. encourage her to live a life of virtue, and then if she continues and acts on this, then that would be a, re a response would be dismissal if she continues to um, act out and to have a homosexual relation talk to other girls about it of course we would have to protect those other girls and um, it, refer her again you know to the priest and um, ask her until she's got this figured out to take some time off from the troop and and to be fair on the other side as well if you discovered a girl who was you know uh opposite sex attracted who was acting out and absolutely. had boyfriends and you know it was a sexually engaged with them same same deal right absolutely it, it and that's just one of many sins sure. this, this is one of many sins you yeah. know if some could have a girl who has a drinking problem or drugs or yeah i mean it's, you know look the exactly. youth are exposed to awful things these days uh, yes. Julie, I just want to ask you real quick. We've got about 30 seconds left. I'd like you to, to uh, respond to uh, Ed Martin, uh, the uh, uh, Boy Scout of America, Catholic Scout uh, guy who says that, uh, you know, this is not what the Boy Scouts did is not in conflict with Catholic teaching. Uh, so what? <laughs> I'd like your response. Um, he's right. It's not in conflict of, of Catholic teaching. But um, again, does it really need to be part of the program? Does it does um, you know the the discussion uh, a sexual discussion need to have? Do we need to even bring it forth? Um, and that's that's something that should be looked at. And again, American Heritage Girls is girls living a life of purity, 
And um, again, we would counsel them through that and, and help them through, uh, along with the pastor and the parent and so forth, anyone else who would be um, good. And, you know, because different parish staffs are going to have different people on staff that could um, address that better. So it, it's a conversation with the child and the family and the, and the church community. Excellent. Very good. Patty Garibay, the executive founder and executive director of American Heritage Girls, doing great jobs there with the ladies and Julie Goodwin, the Catholic committee chair of obviously the same organization. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for everything you're doing for our blessed Lord and to help coach chastity and purity and virtue. Uh, in young ladies because we certainly know that young ladies need it and so do young guys <laughs> thanks very much ladies amen. <laughs> thank, thank you, you michael amen god bless now when we come back we're going to talk about young men and how we need to uh get on board with them you know the the culture has become massively massively emasculated and feminized and you know some people take exception when we say feminized meaning like we think feminine is bad we think feminine is fantastic we just don't think feminine is great in a guy and vice versa. And that's the major issue here is that feminiza feminization, the feminization of the church, the feminization of the culture has essentially crowded out, distorted, not only the masculine, but also the feminine. And that's what we're going to talk about with our next guest. When we come back, take a little commercial break. We will be right back with him to talk about the emasculization and feminization of the culture and what can be done. Michael Voris will be right back with Mic'd Up right after this. Hi there, Church Militant TV fans. Louis Verecchio here from HarvestingTheFruit.com. And we just finished shooting a terrific new series coming to churchmilitant.tv entitled A Conversation With. And you guessed it, the conversation is with me, Louis Verecchio. Host Simon Rafe and I discussed the Second Vatican Council in great detail. And it's definitely something you're going to want to check out. These past few days here at the Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen Studios at churchmilitant.tv have been just great. The crew around here works extremely hard. And when you support them by signing up for a premium account, not only will you be able to see my new show on Vatican II and much, much more, but you really are supporting a terrific apostolate here at churchmilitant.tv. So please, click on the link and get your premium account today. God bless. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mic'd Up. Michael Voris here. By the way, the mic refers to this, not me. <laughs> We're back here with Mic'd Up. We're talking about quite a number of uh, disturbing issues, you know, when, when you... Uh, when you do this kind of work, this kind of apostolate, you know, you obviously see an awful lot of very bad things and things that are disturbing, but probably one of the most disturbing types of things you can see is when young people are pulled off course. I mean, our blessed Lord said, you know, you know, you know don't scandalize any of these young, you tied millstone around your neck and throw you into the ocean, which is where you belong. Uh, and when you see the young, I mean, it's not only because they're young and they possess a certain degree of innocence, and to corrupt that innocence is awful, but beyond that, beyond the corruption of their innocence, is also the sort of destruction that's wrought into the next generation and even the generation after that. So when the whole sort of women's lib thing really caught on in the U.S. in the late 60s and uh, early 70s, it really distorted everything. It distorted, you know, how men see themselves, you know, women, you know, saying, oh, we have to be men. And, it, you know, it's just a disaster. And we are really feeling the effects of that right now, right down to today's youth. You have broken homes, uh, you know, everything you could imagine, everything you could imagine. Well, our next guest here is going is trying to do something about that. He is a wonderful guy. He has got an incredible, incredible thing. I suggest that you really check it out. You should go on and Google Wilderness Outreach and look and see what his uh, uh, what his efforts are, have uh, what, what they have yielded so far. It's really tremendous. We're going to talk to John Bradford. He's the founder of Wilderness Outreach, and he's down in Ohio. Hello, John. How are you? Good, Michael. I'd glad like to, to be ask with you. It's good to be with you too. It's it's uh, you know I, I was reading through a lot of your material earlier today and looking at some things and um, I can't even remember who uh, who actually turned us on to you and said hey you need to check out this guy it's really good but you know high praise every time somebody runs into your organization and your outfit and uh, I'm just going to give you the mic here and say tell us what wilderness outreach is why did you found it you know what's the point uh, you know how Catholic is it uh, you know is this like the Boy Scouts you know the the, the Boy Scouts at Mass in the wilderness <laughs> what 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 is it yeah i guess uh just kind of follow up with what you what your uh, recent guests were talking about uh, we're way beyond the boy scouts in a lot of ways you know we're, uh, we're really about uh 
really addressing this problem with manhood in our culture and in our church today and really calling men to man up. I, one, of the th- one of the sayings of Wilderness Outreach is that we challenge priests, seminarians, and laymen to, uh, to discover their God-given manhood and, and then develop it and figure out how to develop it. Now, let me ask you, when you say they're God-given manhood, how are you understanding that? You know, because a lot of people today think man is, oh, he's compassionate and, you know, la, la, la. not that men shouldn't be compassionate. I mean that, but, you know, the emphasis on more of the what is traditionally associated with feminine uh, roles and traits to the exclusion of what we would typically refer to as masculine. So when you say discover their God-given masculinity, unpack that for us a little bit. What do you mean yeah. by that? Yeah, uh, well written on every man's heart, I mean male, the man, is uh, a sense of adventure and a call to battle, and and in fact, a holy battle. Uh, Each of us as men are called to chase after the truth, in a sense, and hunt it down like like we're on a hunt that our Lord's called us into. And, And in that regard, he's really called us to be the providers and protectors of our church and our families. Now, In today's culture, that sounds awfully, awfully, you know, chauvinistic. I mean, really, come on, John, get with get with the times. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're saying, Mike. It's kind of interesting that some of the the authors today have become predominantly women in some respects, because a lot of the women in our church get this much more so than some of our more softened men get it. Uh, uh, Helen Avari, for instance, uh, you, that's probably a name you've heard before. Mm-hmm. Teresa Tomio. Um, gosh, uh, there's uh, uh, the woman who wrote the book, uh, Mary Eberstadt, uh, mm-hmm. uh, about uh, about uh, Paul the uh, uh Humanae Vitae. And these women really kind of get it, and they understand that there's a complementarity that should exist between men and women, a natural, God-given, holistic, and organic complementarity that our culture is attacking and destroying that. And, and it, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, men are really being sidelined because of this attack of the culture. Okay, so tell me, let's, have a, uh, let's take the case of a, a 13-year-old boy. 13-year-old boy who gets dropped off at your front door, wilderness outreach. Walk me through what happens to him. What does he do? Is it a summer camp? Is it a, is it a get-together every two weeks until he graduates from high school? What, what, what is it? Explain to our viewers what you are. Is it, is it, a, is it a, a kind of a, a, a Boy Scout alternative? What, what is it exactly? Yeah, well, first of all, we're just now developing – a group called the Wilderness Rangers, which is really for boys 11 through 18. And this is just something that's kind of evolved in the past six months. A lot of it's been been uh, pushed, I'd say, and a lot of momentum given to it by some men that I know that have been scout leaders. And they've seen some of the changes in the scouts and are saying, we really want something that's truly Catholic. And the, the scouts had problems way before the 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 newest things that have happened, they constantly were on this direction of getting a little softer and softer through time. If you look at the, the scouts since 1972, I think that the, the uh, population in the scouts has dropped by like 70%. Yeah. So there have been problems in the scouts that have been outside of the problem of, of allowing openly gay boys to enter it. But getting back to that, so we're just now developing that, but the core of wilderness outreach and what the wilderness rangers would be nested in is really about we really serve vocations directors and seminarians and priests that's really at the the heart and soul of our mission along with laymen so for instance this past summer we had uh, uh, two specific expeditions that uh, we went into this year in nevada california with a harrisburg diocese from pennsylvania the lafayette diocese from indiana locations directors and their seminarians and we backpacked in uh, around 10 miles we set up a base camp and during that week we were immersed in worship work asceticism leadership and brotherhood and really it's about the human formation that the culture in a sense has taken away from us that we naturally had in an earlier time when 
fathers raise their sons right next to them. So, so what we're trying to do is really respond to that problem, really engage men in, in a masculine type of orientation to discover who the men that they are, that God made them to be, and then help form them into good priests, good seminarians, and, and then good laymen. That's a, it's a very, very commendable work, John, very commendable. So we got a phone call from Raylan in uh, Louisiana. Uh, now, you're in Ohio, right? That's correct. Uh, whereabouts in Ohio? Lancaster, Ohio. We're about, about 30 miles southeast of Columbus. All right, so it's quasi near the center of Ohio. Right, right. All mm -hmm. right, near Ohio State also, and I went to Notre Dame, so we'll skip right over that part of the conversation, shall we? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> go Notre Dame, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go Irish, I guess, right? All right, Raylan from Louisiana, are you on the, are you on the line? Yes, sir. How you doing, Raylan? Doing fine, Michael. Doing fine. Well, listen, uh, you got John uh, Bradford on here. Do you have a question or a comment for him? Yeah, um, well, you and I met about three years ago at your Bloomington retreat. I'm yes, I remember. Right. As soon as I saw your name here on the on the producer chomp, uh, prompter, I went, oh, I know I know who this is. Exactly, yeah, that's me. And um, what, I, what I've encountered since uh, doing the, uh, the video program I was talking to you about was just uh, as we are, as your, your, um, your guests here are saying, you present those things out there to the uh, – to the public, you know, maybe over social media about, you know, being masculine and, and you get that, and we anticipated it, but you get that immediate pushback from the feminist crowd that really a lot of uh, ladies in the church are very much affected by the whole feminist ideology that we face uh, in our day-to-day -day culture. So um, I just wanted to see if he's encountered that kind of a pushback from promoting the masculine and, uh, and how he has handled that. All right. Well, thanks very much for the question, Raylan. John, have you have you have you run into the feminist buzzsaw? Well, to some extent, but uh, uh, God bless my wife; she's right on top of that. So she's one of my consultants in that respect. But <laughs> what I found in general is that you know, one of the greatest things about our faith, about the the Holy Roman Catholic Church, is that we fly with two two wings as eagles, and one of those wings is faith. And the other one is reason or science. All the science is lining up to show that there's a big problem with culture. There's a big problem with this whole idea of an androgyny. It's not working. The, the, the data keeps coming back that shows how important the father is in the home. I mean, I, I forget what it is. For instance, if you have a, an intact home where there's a mother and father, and the mother takes the children to church, but the father doesn't. He's not engaged. The chance of the children continuing their Catholic faith is about 40%. Right. If you flip that around with the man, it becomes like 60 to 80%. So the effect of a father is well known scientifically. So what's interesting, the, the feminist buzzsaw is actually quite weak, and it does not withstand reason it doesn't withstand the science that's really coming back right now you know one of the things i think is uh you know worth noting is that the when when men are engaged as men they are uh and and i don't mean barbarians and that kind of thing i mean as men uh the way god made them to be they are you know wonderful friends and you know great guys to be around they really right. are, and the and you hit the nail on the head when there is an uh, you know a guy who is a, a father, husband who's just eh, whatever about mass in the case of Catholics, and I'm sure that that probably extends to other uh, other religions as well. When the man's unengaged, you don't care. But you know, if there, there's something in the in the masculine that that we males need to fight, and that is this kind of laziness or sloth. You know, we are perfectly content to sit around and just say uh, nothing and flip the remote. And I know that's a stereotype, but, the, you know, stereotypes exist for a reason. Talk to me about sort of the, the things, forget about the culture telling us things. I mean, the culture's feeding into us and into some men, many men, and turning them into this because the ingredient is already there, right? There's, there's kind of a snake coiled up under the table in the masculine, yeah. as there is in the feminine. Talk about that. What are some of the weaknesses that men have to be specifically concerned about in themselves? Yeah. We, we call that the, the rupture of original sin. So in other words, for instance, we as men have certain desires. We desire to create. We desire to search for the truth. 
and we desire for a great battle. However, if those desires get twisted in a sense, looking through the lens of original sense, they become very me-centered, very I-centered, which fits right into the culture. So it's really a, it's a battle. In fact, that's the internal battlefield. We as men have this internal battlefield. That's where the battle is initially fought and won. So we can't do anything with the culture out there until we come to terms with this internal battlefield and this rupture of original sin that we have to take responsibility for. So, for instance, the, the, father, and the, the father who, say, sits around Saturday, Sunday, watches college football day long and then uh, pro football on Sunday – what he's doing, he's, he's vicariously living that desire for a great battle in his life. But it's being short-circuited into something that's ridiculous. So in other words, he, he really has a desire to fight a great battle, a battle of justice and battle of truth, really God's battle for him, but he's, short, he's choosing to short-circuit himself. And then, you know, he's sitting around watching TV, and then he goes to work on Monday, right? He's, he's away from the family again. So men have to come to that realization. They're in charge. They have the free will, will to say, no, I'm going to choose differently here. And that's, that's really a key battle that we men have. So when you've got a culture that does nothing except, you know, uh, you know look, I'm as the biggest college football fan when it comes to Notre Dame, there is. So, you know, I'll watch something. About it. But skipping that, you're not saying give up all recreation. You're saying take sort of a real good self-inventory, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, the, the point about I'm, I'm all in favor of, I mean, holistic recreation, uh, using the body. So instead of watching a football game, get out and go for a hike or play, you know, even even go out in the backyard and throw the football around with your son. But do something that's that's active on all levels as opposed to watching a video or doing a, a, a battle on a video game, right? Then you become virtual. You're just, once again, you're short-circuiting that desire for true battle that we have. But yeah, men need to really, we need to like raise up and engage our entire body because we as men, the way our body's built, the theology of our body, our nervous system, our musculature, our bones are made to confront the exterior world in a battle situation. And what's interesting is that the culture that men have built, the technology, has softened all that. And it, and it comes back to try to, it tells us a lie that we're not needed anymore, that the, the warrior that we truly are is not needed anymore. So sit back on the couch, eat some donuts, drink a beer, forget about it. That's what it's telling us. And we're allowing, we're allowing them to control that when we have the free will and the ability to stand up and say, no, I'm choosing differently. Now, I'm going to engage myself intellectually, spiritually, and physically on all levels to become a man of God. So let me ask you, when you, when you, <clears throat> two questions, the questions are related. One, how do you get this message to the donut eating, remote clicking dude sitting there watching, keeping track of his fantasy football league there? And when you get it to him, what's the response you get? Yeah, it's, it's, it's more of a gradual work. I, after, you know, this is, this is our our uh, seventh year now since we started the apostolate, I used to try to get in, in men's faces and usually I would either scare them away or they'd want to hit me. So I had to <laughs> Gee, realize I don't know, any, I don't know anything about that at them. all. <laughs> I, had to, yeah, I, had to, I had to kind of hand it over to the Holy Spirit and kind of work on the edges. So there's lots of men that will see this. For instance, I'll go to a men's conference and I usually set up a rock holder I have axes and crosscut saws. I have the liturgy of the hours. And I basically talk about what we do. 80% of the men see that and they say, this looks like something that really gets to me. I would like to do this, right? And, and there's a secret desire that men have because they see something there. They realize it's radical. And I really believe that all men are called to be radical warriors in Jesus Christ. They, this is something that's in the very depths of our heart. So once, once we just start to talk about that and show what we do, the right men start to come. And then the other guys that are so resistant, you know, sooner or later, they're going to hear something and they're going to step forward. But it's, it's a gradual process. But there are a lot of good men and out there that do this. And we have a number of, for instance, good priests, uh, great priests that are chaplains that really uh, 
they're, they're showing men the way and, and how they've done this and, uh, you know, how they can do it as well. John Bradshaw or Bradford, I, I, you know, look, hats off, hats off. I mean, they're, the only way this uh, just flood of junk in the culture is going to be fought is by individuals. You know, you don't have to be a multimillionaire or anything. It's by individuals stepping up, realizing what the deal is, taking a look in the mirror, being honest and saying, I have to do something just like Patty did with the American Heritage Girls and Julie's joined her in. You know, this has to be, you know, this kind of thing. So my hat's off to you. Listen, you got 30 seconds. Give a plug for your organization, Wilderness Outreach. You can see over your head there. How do people get in touch with you? What do they do? Blah, blah, blah. Go. Okay. Uh, You can check us out on Facebook at the Wilderness Outreach page. Like us there. Personally, I'm on Wilderness or I'm on Facebook, John Bradford. So look me up there. On the internet, our webpage is, is www.wildernessoutreach.net. My phone number is 614-679-6761. We have expeditions we're going to start scheduling now for the coming year, and I invite all laymen, priests, and seminarians to look us up and challenge themselves to come out and, and see what it's all about. Really challenge themselves to be the men that God's made them to be. Put them through a hell week, John. (laughs) Thank you, Michael. Very good. Thank you very much. That's John Bradford, founder of the Wilderness Outreach Program. Uh, And, you know, as we were just saying, folks, look, even if you talk about the condition of the church, as Archbishop Fulton Sheen, venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen, used to say, you know, it's up to the lady. He asked the question rhetorically, you know, who's going to save our church? And, uh... Uh, and his answer was, uh, don't look to the priest, don't look to the bishops. It's up to you, the laity, to help our priests to be priests and our bishops to be bishops, what they're supposed to be. And this is all about masculinity. Do not, do not be fooled by the culture saying, oh, no, it's not. this is very much about men being in charge in the sense of being in charge of themselves, not in charge to laud it over somebody, but being in charge of their own emotions, their own feelings, their own everything, their own passions for the good of others, for the service of the others, laying down their life day by day and in at the end of their life, giving up their life if they need to for protection. That is what being a man is, and we have that in the example of the perfect man himself, our blessed Lord on the cross. We're going to sign off now and uh, say we'll see you next week. But in the meantime, you stay tuned to watch churchmilton.tv. This is Miked Up, Michael Voris, and stick with us. And you know all about us. Keep us in your prayers. God bless. Thank you. The Restoration Retreat, the second annual Retreat at Sea from churchmilitant.tv. We invite you to set sail with us this January the 12th for a seven-day retreat at sea to discuss the who, what, where, when, and why of what has gone wrong in the church for the past 50 years. The idea of a Catholic restoration is an immensely dense topic and will undoubtedly take a week's worth of conferences to truly understand. There are many questions circling the minds of faithful Catholics. Why have all my children left the faith? How have I become the crazy religious person in my family? What can I do to restore the faith? How can I get others involved? How did we get here and where are we going? All that and more will be on this year's Restoration Retreat from churchmilitant.tv. Retreatants will be afforded the opportunity for a true spiritual escape from emails, ringing phones, and noisy neighbors. All the rigors of the worldly life will be paused for a week of daily mass, confession, exposition, benediction, Eucharistic procession, and the Holy Rosary. All in addition to the daily conferences, terrific weather, and delicious meals with great Catholic conversation. Please click the link and we'll see you in January.